Let's open our Bibles to uh, Revelation chapter 3. We're in the book of the Revelation, as Dennis mentioned. We're in chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 14 through 22 this morning. Revelation 3, 14 through 22. Open your Bible or navigate on your device so you can follow along. The topic, Jesus tells the Laodiceans he will vomit them out of his mouth unless they acquire from him certain priceless spiritual resources. The title of our message, The Hurl of Great Price. Thank you. That concludes our services this morning. Let's have a word of prayer. <laughs> Lord, uh, as we pay attention to your word, we, like with all se- uh, other, the other six churches, Lord, we want you to speak to us. And uh, Lord, we're hoping that there's nothing about the Laodicean church that relates to us, but probably there is. And so we need your spirit, Lord, to open the eyes of our heart, to be unafraid of your gaze, so that you could burn away that which is wood, hay, and stubble, and so that you could refine that which is gold and precious, so that we'd be more like you, or in love with you, more able to affect a world for you. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name, and those who agreed said, amen. You may have heard the rumors that I like coffee. (laughs) A few of you mistakenly think I am obsessed with coffee, and especially with gear for making it in a variety of unusual ways, as the saying goes. Haters going to hate. <laughs> what you probably don't know is that I've recently discovered the world of international bottled mineral waters. Let's take a random country, say Italy. <laughs> Most people have heard of San Pellegrino, but have you heard of Ferrarel, or Fuji, or Pana, or San Benedito, or Sole. Those are all Italian bottled waters. In fact, finewaters.com lists about 600 brands of Italian domestic bottled water. I didn't misspeak, I said 600. I know what you're wondering. You wanna know how many bottled waters there are in Turkey. I know you so well. The same website says there are 288. Now, there wasn't any bottled water in the first century Turkey when John wrote the revelation to the seven churches located there. But water is important for our understanding of the letter Jesus dictated to him for the Laodiceans. You see, Laodicea had almost no water sources of its own. According to one document I read, and I quote, no other city in the Lycus Valley was as dependent on external water supplies as was Laodicea. Two neighboring cities sent water to Laodicea, Hierapolis and Colossae. Hierapolis, six miles away, was known for its naturally hot spring water. The baths of Hierapolis attracted citizens from all over the Roman Empire. Colossae was known for its cold water. Located about 11 miles from Laodicea, it was situated at the foot of Mount Cadmus, which peaked at 9,000 feet. Ice cold snow and rain fed streams rushed down the mountain into Colossae. One water was naturally hot at its source, one water was naturally cold at its source. By the time either arrived in Laodicea, it was lukewarm. Now, isn't Jesus going to tell the Laodiceans that they are neither hot nor cold, but lukewarm? As Mr. Spock might say, fascinating. Of course, it's so much more than fascinating for us because God can use it to speak to us about our own spiritual temperature. I'll organize my thoughts around two points. Number one, Jesus takes your spiritual temperature. And number two, you can tweak your spiritual temperature. Let's take a look first of all in verses 14 through 17 where Jesus is taking spiritual temperatures. Now this is the last of the letters to the seven churches. Too bad it wasn't a case of saving the best for last. Quite the contrary, Jesus had nothing good to say about this church. Verse 14, and to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Right away, you probably notice something odd about this greeting. 
Rather than describing them as the church in Laodicea, as with all the other churches, most Bibles translate the phrase, the church of the Laodiceans. It sounds like they had taken ownership of the church away from the Lord. The name Laodicea lends itself to that interpretation. It's derived from two words which mean the rule or decision of the people. It's where we get our word laity from. The Laodiceans ruled themselves. They were not submitted to the authority of Jesus Christ. To this self-governing body, Jesus described himself as the Amen. Amen translates to so be it. We use it in prayer as if it meant the end. Isn't that what we do? We pray until somebody says amen, and then we understand, well, now we're done. And, and that's okay. It's, it's a custom. I'm not belittling that. We're going to continue to do that. Just know that amen is really a statement of agreement. We should only say amen when we agree with what someone has said. A prerequisite for walking with the Lord is that you always agree with Him. You read the Word. Whatever you find in it, you say, so be it. Sounds simple, but of course, any time that we're sinning, living our own life, making our own decisions, self-sufficient, we're not saying so be it because we understand the word and we're doing our own thing. Now, Jesus was and is the faithful and true witness. Faithful witness means his word can be received with confidence. He will keep his word and he has the power to do so. True witness means that his word is never speculation or guesswork. It is rock solid. The beginning of the creation of God doesn't mean that Jesus was the first thing created. It means that he created all things. It means that all things have their beginning or their origin in him. As you read in Colossians 1.16, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Reverencing Jesus as the creator of all things puts a punctuation mark on this description of Jesus. By definition, the creature ought to submit to the creator. Thankfully, the creator is faithful and true, and we should therefore always say amen to his word. Now, Jesus' comments and criticisms from this point forward will make more sense to you if you see that he is using as an illustration the sharing of a meal with these individuals. He says, for example, in verse 20, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into him and dine with him and he with me. But it was a dinner gone bad. He'll describe the things they serve him as being neither hot or cold, but unappetizingly lukewarm. And he'll indicate that what they serve him causes him food poisoning. And so verse 15, I know your works that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now the Laodiceans were familiar with lukewarm water. Because by the time water arrived from Hierapolis or Colossae, it had become lukewarm. Jesus was applying that same description to their works and comparing them to food being served at a dinner. When we are talking about spiritual things in our culture, we normally think of being hot as something good and to be desired and being cold as something bad and to be avoided. We can't think that way here. In the context of this letter to the Laodiceans, there's absolutely nothing wrong with being cold. In fact, it can be a good thing. We've already said that the cold water of Colossae was something good and to be desired. It was a special treat to have cold water at a time before there was any means of refrigeration. Also, when you're eating a meal, some things are better served hot and other things are better served cold. When something that ought to be hot or cold sits out too long, it becomes lukewarm and it's just not as tasty. Today we can just nuke it in the microwave or put it back in the fridge or the freezer or add ice to it. Not so in the first century. Lukewarm food was not very appealing. Taste, however, is the least of the problems with lukewarm food. If hot food or cold food sits out too long at room temperature, it can allow bacteria to grow to dangerous levels that can cause severe illness. I believe that this is what Jesus had in mind when he said they were neither hot nor cold but had become lukewarm. The Laodiceans had assumed room temperature.
They had assumed room temperature. Have you ever heard someone use the expression, he assumed room temperature, as a cruelly humorous way of announcing that a person is dead? And you've never been around cops. <laughs> now you have. <laughs> Were the Laodiceans spiritually dead? Were they non-believers? Well, maybe, undoubtedly some were. Some of the language and description of them lends itself to their being spiritually dead and their trespasses and sins, never born again. The fact that they were gathered as a church doesn't mean they were saved. I'd uh, bet a lot of money that there are folks here in this assembly that are not Christians. You've never been born again. You've never given your heart to Jesus Christ. Other language in this letter, however, points to their being saved. For example, in verse 19, Jesus says he will discipline them the way you discipline your own children. I have to conclude that at least some of them were saved, even though terribly backslidden. Can a believer be described as assuming room temperature? Well, sure, a Christian can assume room temperature by being out too much in the world. You can take on the characteristics and habits and pursuits of the world so much that it is hard to distinguish you from the average non-believer. I think this church, the church of the Laodiceans, was full of both non-believers and room temperature backslidden Christians. A case can be made for either, so why not both? Room temperature food that has been out too long makes you sick. You'll likely vomit it up from food poisoning. Jesus said the Laodiceans were like that. They had assumed room temperature in such a way that it caused him to spew them out of his mouth. The worldliness that caused their lukewarmness is described in verse 17. He says, because you say, I am rich, I've become wealthy, and I have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Rich means just what you think it means. They had plenty of money. Have become wealthy is better translated, they were increased with goods. In other words, they used their money to buy this world's goods. They invested heavily in the world, but not in heaven. Rich people who surround themselves with the comforts of this world begin to trust in the external rather than the eternal. It's easy to begin to think you have need of nothing. Maybe we're not rich or wealthy or increased with goods. Of course, we always are by the rest of the world's standards, but by our standards, maybe we're not. We can still want to be. The very love of those things, the love of the world, will just as quickly lukewarm our works as actually having riches and wealth and goods. It's a mistake to assume you're just fine when in fact you've assumed room temperature. You're familiar with anorexia sufferers who look in the mirror and even though they are dangerously thin, they see themselves as being overweight. Jesus held up a spiritual mirror to the Laodiceans to show them they were wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. That's certainly not their description of themselves. They saw themselves as wealthy and increased with goods and in need of nothing. And Jesus said, no, look in the mirror. You are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. They were blind beggars, so wretched and miserable they didn't even have clothes to wear, but were naked. And so we're to look into the mirror of God's word. We need to believe the image in the mirror Jesus holds up, not the image we might have of ourselves. Are you dead? Well, you are unless you've been born again. The Bible says that if you're not a Christian, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you are dead in trespasses and sins. And you're headed for a second death, an eternal death separated from the Lord. Uh, it's actually separated from everyone and everything in utter darkness and pain uh, forever. And so look in the mirror. This is the mirror Jesus holds up when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And, and you, if you don't see yourself as a poor, wretched, miserable sinner in that mirror, uh, then you're uh, deceiving yourself. Are you backslidden? You are if you aren't saying amen to everything in the Word of God, but are harboring sin. Agree with the Lord and stop sinning. I, I like, that's what I, I want to emphasize at the end. If you're backslidden, if you're sinning, just say amen. Say, so be it, Lord. I agree with you. I see it. And I'm not going to do it anymore. I quit right now. And the Holy Spirit will empower you to do that. Now, you can tweak your spiritual temperature, verses 18 through 22. The USDA cautions you to keep hot foods hot, cold foods cold. 
Bacteria grows most rapidly in the range of temperatures between 40 degrees and 140 degrees, doubling in number in as little as 20 minutes. Now, I know what you're thinking. Who cares? Well, you will when you eat a breakfast burrito in a few minutes. <laughs> you're going to care that we know the danger zone and that we're keeping your hot foods hot and your cold foods cold. And this range of temperatures is called the danger zone. You and I as Christians are constantly in a spiritual danger zone. Jesus did not take us out of the world. He left us in the world so that we could affect it for good. But he told us that in the world we should expect tribulation. He told us since the world hated him, it will hate us. The danger zone is where we operate. It's where we live. It's where we will continue to operate and live until we go to be with Jesus. It becomes a problem, however, when we no longer see the world as a danger zone, but have turned it into our comfort zone. Jesus tells us how to regulate our temperature to stay safe in the danger zone. He begins in verse 18. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. There are three things you need to know about the city of Laodicea. These would come up in any Google search about what it was famous for. Number one, it was a prosperous city noted for many banks. It was a banking center. Number two, they manufactured a medicinal eye ointment there. And number three, they bred and raised sheep with unusual black wool, and they were therefore noted for the garments that were made from that wool. The Laodiceans were wealthy, depositing gold into their many banks. Maybe you follow the stock market, maybe I should, but I don't. And that's why it bugs me that one of the apps that Apple won't let me delete is the one that checks the stock market. I don't care. I'm too busy doing coffee ratios. But anyway, I do own because we were given this as a gift, it's a precious gift to us, I do own one share of Disney. My dividend last year was $1.25. I might buy another share and, and double my money, but anyway. The Laodiceans had all the gold they needed to pad the danger zone with the comforts and luxuries and distractions of the world to make it more comfortable. As Daryl Cartrip said in Cars, short-term gain, long-term loss. Actually, it's not even a short-term gain because you can't trust in this world's goods. The comfort they offer is always fleeting and false. It, what does it uh, profit you if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? And so we don't want to be putting our trust in this world. Now, Jesus is a better gold broker than any banker. If for no other reason, he's able to store up your rewards in heaven where they are safe from theft and corruption and all type of loss. Jesus is also a sort of alchemist when it comes to gold. He can make gold out of your trials. He says here, he's looking for gold refined in the fire. He's talking about what we might call Job gold. Job said, this is from Job 23.10, but God knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. Real wealth isn't measured by how much gold you have in the bank, but how much Job gold has been refined through your life and through its trials. Now, Jesus next said, buy from me white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. Laodicea was famous for its black wool. It was a garment district, and I'm sure the Laodiceans were all decked out in the finest apparel. They could afford to visit their own personal tailors and have tailor-made outfits suitable for every occasion. You've seen those red carpet interviews preceding major events. They always ask, who are you wearing? The Laodiceans were wearing the world when they should have been wearing Jesus. I don't know if, how this would ever come about, but if anybody ever asked you or asked you, who are you wearing, you should just say, I'm wearing Jesus. I have his white robe of righteousness. And, and that's the way to think of it. On earth, they could strut about in the finest black wool garments. None of their earthly garments, however, would stand a chance in heaven. They'd all be disintegrated, leaving them naked. I mean, if you try and get into heaven wearing black wool, you're in trouble. 
We saw in a previous study that the Bible uses clothing to illustrate salvation so that we can understand it. When you get saved, it's as if Jesus takes your inappropriate garments and gives you instead His robe of righteousness. It's the only garment that is heaven approved. Look for the heaven label. Remember those commercials? Remember the union? Look for the union label. Look for the heaven label. And that's the only thing that you can stand in the presence of God in. Otherwise, you're in big trouble. And then we showed you how in your obedience to the Lord and in your service to Him, you can adorn that basic robe of righteousness, which was a gift to you, with precious things that Jesus gives you at His reward seat to reward you for works done in His name and motivated uh, by Him. Uh, we should therefore be busy adorning our robes rather than falling in love with the things of the world. Only when life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. Now, Jesus next said, I'll anoint your, uh, he wanted them to anoint their eyes with eye salve that you may see. Popular eye ointment known as Phrygian powder was produced in Laodicea. This will probably pop up on Facebook soon. Now, I'll, I'm just going to leave that alone right now. I can tell, I can tell that I'm going to get in trouble if I say any more about that. But anyway, Jesus called them blind. No amount of Phrygian powder would restore sight to the blind. But Jesus could anoint and thereby open blind eyes. And we talk about a person being blind to something that's going on in their life. They've been blinded by the God of this world. We then pray for them that their eyes would be opened by Jesus Christ. In each of our lives, there are areas of blindness that require the anointing of Jesus so that we might see them. One commentator wrote, and I quote, Sometimes when you come to church, suddenly in the message you see yourself as you really are. And it's not a very nice sight. And it's as though Jesus is putting the spittle on your eyes and saying, go and wash. It's as if Jesus is saying to you that he is putting salve on your eyes, the eyes of your soul, so that you can see yourself and him. Verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. That sounds like family discipline, does it not? At least some of the Laodiceans must have been saved because the Lord speaks to them as if they were his children. There was nothing good about the church of the Laodiceans, but God nevertheless held out hope that they would repent. More than just holding out hope, this is really a command to repent for their own good. If in any way, however so slight, you resemble a Laodicean, you should be zealous about repenting. Agree with Jesus, turn to Him from your sin or your situation. The Holy Spirit will enable your repentance. He will empower it and make it true. Verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. It's become popular for Bible teachers to say that this verse used for evangelism is really spoken to a church and therefore it shouldn't be used as an evangelistic text. That's not really fair because as we've seen, there were both believers and non-believers in Laodicea. It is an appropriate verse for anyone in whatever spiritual state you find yourself. If you're not a Christian, the sinless, risen, ascended Son of God sends His Holy Spirit to operate on your heart by grace, freeing your will to make a decision for Christ. It's our job to portray Jesus Christ lifted up on the cross of Calvary, dying for the sins of the world. And then the Lord said that He would, through that cross, draw all men to Himself. In other words, He would make His salvation known. And so if you're here this morning, and if you're not a Christian then the Holy Spirit is operating on your heart. Your heart is hard, it's wicked, you're dead in your trespasses and sins, but God's grace can free the will so that you can make a decision for Jesus Christ. When we end this morning, uh, we'll have a time when you can come forward for prayer, and if you want to receive Christ as your Savior, that would be the time to do it, because the Holy Spirit is drawing you to the love and beauty 
the grandeur and splendidness of Jesus Christ dying for your sins. If you're not a Christian, then that's what we're here to tell you. He's knock, knock, knocking on your heart's door, and that means you're enabled to answer the knocking and let him in. Now, I have no problem thinking of Jesus knocking on my heart's door when I'm backslidden. If I am in sin, I'm acting as if the Lord isn't present with me. He is, of course, but I'm not living that way. His knocking is a metaphor to shock me into the realization I have kicked him out at least temporarily while I sin. Some of you as children might have a sad memory of your dad pulling up to a bar or a casino and asking you to wait in the car. Hours later, he'd emerge either drunk or broke or both. That's a little like what we try to do to Jesus. We ask him to wait outside while we go in and sin. It's stupid, but we do it anyway. You've heard it said, and it's true, that Jesus will not force his way through the door. You must open it from the inside. But that doesn't mean Jesus isn't persistent. He knocks, and I say he knocks incessantly until there's no hope. Until, if you're a non-believer, you've died, and after this, it's, there's just judgment. And for a believer, as long as you live. And so knock, 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 knock. Louder at times, too. Each knock is intended to capture your spiritual attention, to get you to leave your sin in order to answer the knocking and get back into fellowship with Jesus. He's gentle but persistent because he loves you. And so, you know, we accurately, we, we say Jesus isn't going to break the door down. He's not going to kick the door in even though he could. It's up to you to open it. But, you know, I, I think it'd be much more annoying to just keep knocking. We don't regular. I told Pam, I said, you don't have to open the door just because somebody knocks on it. Are you, are you with me on this? Amen. Can I get an amen out of that? Amen. There's, a, there's an old kind of, you know, maybe in the 50s, people knocked on your door and you felt obligated to open it. Fuller Brush Man, Helms Bakery, you know, all these different guys and stuff. But now, you know, you open the door and it, you're in trouble. And, and so, you, you, you know, you need to have surveillance and stun guns and all that kind of stuff. But uh, anyway... But, you know, people knock on the door and then you kind of, well, well, yeah, now they're gone. They only stay there for maybe 30 seconds. Imagine just somebody just keeps knocking on your door just rhythmically. Over and over and over again. It's like Chinese water torture or something, you know. And so I'm not saying Jesus is torturing you, but Jesus is persistent. When he says, I'm knocking on your door, he's not just going to leave a flyer like the JWs do. I mean, he's knocking on your door because you need him to come in. And he's going to keep knocking while there is hope. He loves you. Jesus wants to dine with you. One of the accusations that the religious leaders of Israel had against Jesus was that he was a glutton. It seems that Jesus was always eating with people. Of course, he was not a glutton. It helps to know the customs and the culture of first century Jews. Eating with someone was thought to be a form of intimate sharing and fellowship. As each person broke off a piece of bread from the loaf and dipped it in the common bowl, they were being nourished by the same food. It was an illustration of two people or more becoming more like one another, more familiar with one another, more intimate, if you will, with one another. Jesus ate with people, not because he was a glutton, but to demonstrate God's grace. God himself in the person of Jesus Christ was condescending to share fellowship with sinners. Verse 21, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. Also, I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. We showed you last week, it is the Christian who overcomes, not the overcomer who becomes a Christian. You can overcome the world. It's a choice you make moment by moment, day by day. If you're struggling, if you're a Christian, you're struggling with something today, you can overcome it. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, enormous, amazing power, resides in you to help you overcome whatever it is you're struggling with. Jesus overcame by faithfully completing his mission to go to the cross. He did it in the power of the Holy Spirit. He was raised from the dead and rewarded with a seat at the Father's right hand from which he will return to rule the universe. You can overcome by faithfully completing your mission, which is to walk with Jesus led and empowered by the same Holy Spirit. You'll be raised from the dead or raptured, and when Jesus returns in his second coming, you will rule with him. What strikes me most about verse 21 is that you don't see it coming in this letter. 
not after the strong condemnation of the Laodiceans. Can you imagine anybody worse than these guys and gals? These self-sufficient, miserable, poor, wretched, naked, blind people are nevertheless told that through repentance they can rule with Jesus Christ. I would think they're disqualified. That, that maybe they can come back to church. But Jesus says, no, no, you're going to rule with me forever. Not that they might barely make it into heaven, but that they will have seats of honor. Are you without hope today? You shouldn't be. The Lord wants to lift your head heavenward. Let Him. Make sure that your hopelessness isn't something that you enjoy. And here's what I mean by that. Some people, they, they just say, well, it's hopeless. I, I can't get out of this situation that I'm in. Jesus Christ says you can. He said, these are the worst people that he can describe. Miserable, poor, wretched, blind, naked sinners who think they're saved. He says, you just need to repent. And then guess what? I will lift you up. I'll lift your head. I'll lift you into heaven. I'll give you a position of authority. The only thing that we should say to that is amen. So be it. Because the Lord said it's true. So I don't care what I think is true or what I feel is true. I think about what the Lord says is true, and I shoot for that. Verse 22, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Did Laodicea listen to this letter? Did they do anything about it? No. It appears in church history that nobody in that church let Jesus in. There's no future history of that church. There are no traditions that come from that church. There are no legends. Nothing has come down to us. If you go to the town today, there is not even a trace of that church, not a ruin, nothing. It begs the question, am I listening to this letter? Are you listening? Let's pause and listen to it right now.